A warm welcome to this debate. With slow growth plaguing much of the global economy, can women be the answer to boost it? By adding women to the workforce, the US economy is 14% larger. Companies with women on the board outperform those who don't. But is the evidence incontrovertible? After all, a gender gap persists. Women are underrepresented in top jobs and are paid less. So we're asking today, should women be running the world economy? I can't think of a better panel to dissect the issue and to propose solutions. Joining me are Cheryl Sandberg, Chief Operating Officer and Board Member of Facebook. Pumzile Malambo Naguka, Executive Director of UN Women. Christine Lagarde, the first woman to be Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And our so representative of the opposite sex, <laughs> Carlos Ghosn, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Renault Nissan Alliance. Welcome to all of you. Cheryl, I'm going to start with you. And I'm going to go rapidly down the panel and ask you the question, should women be running the world economy? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she would agree. And Christine was going to clap our hands, too. And I know Carlos was. Yeah, clearly <laughs> Carlos was. Carlos was, too. We, we don't know what it would be like if women were in more leadership positions. We don't know if the world would be more peaceful if women ran more than 19 countries. We don't know if companies would be more, well, I think we do actually know that companies would be more productive at scale. Um, but I think we should try this. And I think there's a lot of data to suggest that the performance would increase dramatically. Yeah. Well, if we are to address generation after generation of poverty-stricken communities and societies, we have to empower women because women are the only force that can ensure that we reduce poverty sustainably. Because when women's quality of life improves, the quality of life of their children improves, and the poverty in that particular family from generation to generation is cut off. Christine, I think you already run the global economy. <laughs> but what would you say to that? So I'd better do a good job if I could. Uh, two points. One is I completely disagree with the way you've characterized Carlos, because I don't think we should say uh, the opposite sex. <laughs> you know, Simone de Beauvoir used to write some 40 years ago uh, the second sex talking about us, the women. Yeah. And I think we should be far more clever than people were in those days. Mm. It is the other sex, but not the opposite sex, because it's a battle that we have to win together because it's going to be in the global interest. Mm. Point number two, with only about 20% of women at, the be at best mm. uh, in charge, in position, uh, having uh, broken the glass ceiling and so on and so forth, and obvious evidence that they are good managers and maybe better, that they're good investors and maybe better, that they're good board members and maybe better, and so on and so forth. There is no doubt that we've got to do it. And in mm. places where it's been tried, or it will be tried, we're seeing results. Mm. All right, Carlos, I'm going to reintroduce you. Oh, Carlos Ghosn, our sole member of the, the other sex. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should women be running the global economy? Yeah, I mean, we have three examples here that we're getting there. You know, <laughs> there was a huge gap. It was not normal. We're closing this gap. We're not getting there. I'm, um, as you know, been fighting and promoting diversity in general, and gender parity is an important element, particularly women in leadership. It's necessary. We have plenty of examples showing that it's a good thing. We're getting there. I'm very happy. Mm. Uh, Pumzile, can I ask you, what is the most compelling piece of evidence that the gender gap is harmful to countries? You know, let me just, because we have an audience of business people here, companies that uh, promote women into positions uh, outperform their peers by 34%. Now, if your business is to make your company perform, that is an important fact. However, if we think about the rights of women, in particular, reproductive rights, if women were in control of their bodies mm -hmm. and they took the responsibility to space their children, mm -hmm. a lot of women would have as many children as they could look after. And that would mean the balance between the people and the planet would be much better for everybody. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, in terms of companies, what is the kind of most compelling 
argument that you would say, you know, listen, this just shouldn't happen. We should be sort of solving this. It's the same facts, the facts that we're all repeating, which are that companies outperform. When you have more women in leadership positions, those companies outperform. And importantly, when you have more women in leadership positions, those companies have better work-life policies for men and women. Mm -hmm. So there's a chicken and egg going on. We need better corporate policies, better public policy for us to get more women in leadership roles. We need more women in leadership roles because more women in leadership roles support better public and corporate policies. Mm -hmm. And of course, peace and security. Yeah. Definitely, the world mm -hmm. will be at peace. There will be better security if women had more to do with deciding when to shoot or not, and I'm sure they'll decide not to shoot. <laughs> Christine, can I come to you on this? In terms of countries, um, what's the most compelling uh, evidence that you've seen that countries would be uh, better off in terms of growth if there were the gender gap were closed? If you allow me, I would go back to the point you made earlier about companies, because that's also where it has to happen. Sure. Uh, that's where the, the gender gap is not, uh, not really closing. It's mm -hmm. It has improved. It is stable at the moment. It's not impro improving significantly. Half the computers, half the cars, and about 70% of the household products in the United States, and that's the only example that we have which is sort of associated with data, are bought mm -hmm. by women. Mm -hmm. Now, when your customers are women, you better make sure that your workforce that your management and that your board includes as many women as the percentage of those that actually buy your products, mm -hmm. because then you understand what it is. And I very strongly believe in the fact that an organization has to be the mirror of the people that it targets. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a compelling uh, argument. Mm -hmm. Then you just look at the Nordic countries. Uh, they are at the top of the list in terms of um, generally growth, governance, uh, going through the crisis with flying colors. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They are the ones that are performing best in terms of gender access, in terms of dealing with diversity in a, much, in a very successful uh, way. And I, would, I hope you're going to talk about Japan. But I think that's going to be a very interesting case mm -hmm. to follow in the next couple of years, to see whether money is put where the mouth has been, which is in and of itself a great achievement, mm -hmm. opening the market to women, making sure that the Japanese women can access yeah. jobs, making sure that there is enough budgeted money to actually provide for daycare centers. Mm -hmm. And the list goes on, not just there, but in many other countries. Actually, this is a great time to bring in Carlos, because Shinzo Abe, the Japanese prime minister, said at Davos the Japanese economy would be 16% larger if women participated at the same rate as men um, in the workforce. So for you, um, if you think about uh, the most compelling piece of evidence that you've mustered uh, to increase women on your board, what do you think, what would you share? Well, first, I do agree with what the Prime Minister is saying, and I think, frankly, this is a very conservative estimate uh, for a very simple reason. As you know, Japan is on a demographic decline, yep. and uh, from one side, from the other side, it needs much more uh, people in the workforce, uh, people in management, much more talent, and there is a huge reservoir in Japan constituted mm. by women who can play a much bigger role. So it's a, Japan is a very clear case in which uh, women jumping in and taking more leadership positions are going to help a very large economy. And I think the estimate is very conservative. Now, I'm going to come back to a statistics that uh, 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 Christine has mentioned. is about the uh, car, uh, the car industry. In the car industry, uh, I'm going to go above the United States and talk about globally because we have statistics globally. 45% of the cars globally, and this is including all countries, 45% of the cars sold worldwide, 82 million cars sold worldwide, are made by women, women alone, practically. And, but, 85, they buy. 45%, they're yeah. buying it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. This is the ultimate decision maker, yeah. 45%. And 85% of the cars sold are influenced by women, 85%. So now, when you, <laughs> when you know, when you know, no, okay. <laughs> when you see how women look at cars, which yeah. is a different way, a different way like men, like in them, obviously they are interested about the engine, but not too much, transmission, not too much, <laughs> driving performance, but not too much, but they're looking at other things, safety, functionality, position right. into the car, and everything else. It is a fundamental product issue. So you need to make decision on product. You need to decision on the way you even communicate on your product, which is mainly with taking in consideration strongly the way women look at the, uh, at the product. So having women in a leadership position, mm. 
it, it, it's uh, coming back that I mean, this is a business issue. It becomes a business issue that you want to make sure that your product is going to be appealing mm. to these 85% of cases mm. when the decision yeah. made is going to be for your brand. Yeah. So it's a very important issue. Mm. It's in some cases economic issue, but for companies, yeah. it's a really market, uh, you know, competitive issue. Uh, I'm going to bring in the audience right now, and I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands um, on it. We've been talking about the evidence. We've been talking about a gender gap that persists. Is the issue simply that there's gender discrimination? If you agree that it's just gender discrimination, please raise your hand, a show of hands. There is no discrimination. <laughs> OK, I think it's the phrasing. It's the phrasing. Let me try again. Yeah. Um, an important part of <laughs> Important part of Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> is, uh, is the problem, is a big part of the problem that there's just a lot of gender discrimination? If you raise your hand. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> I'm going to now ask you, I mean, how big a problem is the fact that there's just gender discrimination. A lot of the audience, when I rephrase the question, <laughs> a lot of the audience seems to think so. It's a big part of the problem. It's been interesting for me. I've now been with Lena in my book all over the world. And cultures are so different, right? Cultures within different parts, the United States, to Japan, to France, to Africa, China, it's all different. Except stereotypes of men and women are actually pretty much the same everywhere in the world. We believe men should be assertive, aggressive leaders. Everywhere in the world, we believe women should be nurturing, giving to others. Leadership is associated with the masculine expectations. We call little girls bossy. We don't really call little boys bossy because a little boy leads. But when a little girl leads, we call her bossy. There is a negative phrase for that in every language I'm aware of. I'm going to ask this audience two questions. Men only, please. If you're a man in this audience, please raise your hand if you have been told you're too aggressive at work. There's usually a couple. <laughs> if you're a woman in this audience, please raise your hand if you have been told you're too aggressive at work. Now, here's the next question. If you're a man in this audience, please raise your hand if you have anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? <laughs> Don't your kids need you? Should you be working? Anyone? You are my first two hands I've ever gotten. If you're a woman in this audience, please raise your hand. If anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? Those expectations go all over the world. And what happens is that when women assert, when they do the things that make them leaders, yeah. we don't like them. And therefore, we don't promote them. We don't vote for them in the same numbers. I gave this talk in New York as part of my book launch. I walked off the stage. And the CEO of a major company kind of grabbed my arm, and he said, thank you. And I said, for what? He said, there's a big job in my company open, the CFO role. It's often the step to be CEO. Mm -hmm. We have two candidates, a man and a woman. Her results are better, but he's much better liked. I was about to pick the man. I'm picking the woman. Mm -hmm. He followed up with me nine months later. He said, she's doing great. Mm -hmm. That gender bias is not mm. all of what's holding women back. Lots mm. of things are holding women back, mm. like public policy and institutional bias. Mm. But the gender bias against women in leadership mm. is an absolutely crucial part of the problem. Christine, can I bring you in on this? How much of a problem do you think is just discriminatory attitudes? I, I think there is a lot of it. And, uh, and I think we should not only focus on the advanced economies, we should also bring into the, the, the you know, great show uh, the uh, low-income countries, the emerging market economies, and particularly those economies and those societies where f the, the, the female gender is repressed full stop, mm -hmm. where girls don't have access to education, where being a woman is e immediately translated as, you're going to slave for me. I know it's not the majority of the situations, mm -hmm. But there are cases like that. I mean, it's I hope you're going to talk about it. And, and that's where really your action uh, is, is critically important. Mm -hmm. And where we have to help them leaning in, but we also have to lift the veil of discrimination against them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and in fact, I think it's important that you also underline the fact that it's an ethical to do and women have got rights, in addition to the fact that it makes economic sense. 
above everything else. It's a right and it's, and it's ethical. Mm. To have a child of 11 being married off, and we call that child a bride, and we call that a marriage. It is a union that is forced on a child. It is an adult who is having an improper relationship with a child. And we should not dignify that and call it a marriage. It's because we are changing. Uh, uh, we, have to, we have to change that vocabulary mm -hmm. because it almost gives it a sense of okayness, and it's not no. okay. It, it is more like slavery than it's like marriage. Absolutely. It is yeah. slavery, and it's modern day slavery, and it is happening all over the world, mm -hmm. even and in some fairly advanced economies. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The gender gap is not a new issue, um, it's been around for a very long time. And um, which policies in the past just haven't worked, Carlos? Not I think, I think uh, what doesn't work, and we know it particularly in society which are extremely conservative towards, towards women, is to establish some principle and goodwill and uh, leave it in the open and uh, you know, ask people to do their best. This doesn't work. I mean, I, I can tell you that in, in, in our case, uh, Nissan Motors in Japan, uh, we had to go to quotas. I mean, I, I, you know, when you start and you have 2% of your management pool made by women. There is no way with big principle and uh, good attitude you're gonna change this radically. We had to put ourselves some quotas and objective by saying, you know, in the next two years, we're gonna have to double this number and with the next uh, uh, seven years, we're gonna triple it, etc. We end up today being even at a ridiculously low number of 8% of management, but this is practically three times the average of corporate Japan. So, so quota is important. Why? Because quota leads to action. The action means hiring, training, coaching, uh, putting in the process of the company uh, systematically decision, forcing the selection of female potential at all the levels. If you don't do that, I mean, if you don't do that, you're just gonna, you know, lose a lot of time or. Uh, you know, have a lot of goodwill, which is dispersed by saying, you know, we told you it doesn't work. I just want to add one thing on top of discrimination. I think, uh, yes, there is discrimination. It's obvious, and depending on what country you can, you can size it. But what is the most important is training and coaching. This is extremely important. Because you may end up into a lot of situations where you have very talented women, very talented women, who are losing, not having enough self-confidence to go for the job or to go for the challenge. So if they are not coached and they are not prepared and mm. somebody doesn't, doesn't, and this starts at the education, you know, when, mm. uh, when, 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 when women are girls, you know, to tell them we are at the same level, you're expecting the same thing from them, they have to go for the same, you know, if, if this doesn't exist, you're gonna lose a lot of time and a lot of potential is gonna be lost. Can I add something to that? It's really interesting because the mentoring, sponsoring, training, as you're saying, is a huge issue. So in the United States, 64% of male managers are afraid to be alone in the room with a woman. Because we're scary? <laughs> because they're afraid they'll be accused of discrimination, because they're afraid they'll be accused of harassment. You know, we like people like us naturally. People gravitate towards people like them, so you have that. You put what is the appearance of impropriety or the potential for that on top of that, and it's a really silencing situation, and it's one that no one really talks about. Mm -hmm. A man and a man in a room looks like mentoring, it looks like training. Mm -hmm. A man and the woman in the room doesn't look like that. Mm -hmm. And until we bring that issue out into the table and talk about it at our companies and say, you know what? It's a badge of honor to mentor a woman. And everyone has to behave appropriately, but you have to be able to have conversations alone to coach someone. And we need to get that issue on the table because mm -hmm. it's not discussed enough and it's holding women back. Uh, can I also, uh, just, go, just on this quota issue, does anybody yeah. have a view on this? Because this has been a source of some controversy for, uh, for perhaps for women. Christine. It, yeah. I was strongly against mm -hmm. it because I thought that women should be recognized on their own merits. Mm -hmm. And there was no reason there should be you know, any particular thresholds or, or requirements or sanctions or penalties associated with it until I grew up in, in a big international law firm that I love, but where the number of female partners was so low, and had been so low for such a long time, that I soon realized that unless we had at least targets, if not quotas, there was no way we were going to you know, jump the right step in order to 
you know, have a significant number of female in the partnerships. So I completely changed my approach. I'm pro quotas, I'm pro targets, and I think we should be made accountable in all the organizations we're in in order to reach those numbers. Mm. I mean, with the gender prejudice that we know exists in our society, not unless we do something to make the playing field more equal, women will just not be identified as leaders. So quotas, unfortunately, uh, some people do not like them. But for now, they are actually necessary. When we reach a time when uh, you don't expect women to perform double uh, compared to a man in order for them to be given the same recognition in a man, we probably will not uh, need quotas. But for now, we actually need quotas because they are giving women a head start in most of the countries, in politics, in boardroom. This is, this is just the world that we're living in right now. Mm. By the way, that's where the Nordic countries have gone. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, the European Union is now setting under a directive a quota for board members. And I think, I think it's, it's a required step. Yeah. Mm. Not for the long term, yeah. but it's a required step. Mm. Hamzile, can I just push you a little bit more on in terms of leveling the playing field? Mm. What kind of policies um, would you propose? Well, quotas would be one, uh, one policy, but also investing in women so that when they are in position, they are also able to, to, to perform. Mm -hmm. So in situations where uh, we are providing education, investing in education, in, in training, it is actually important that we start by ensuring that the representation of women in a training program is mm. adequate. Mm. When r these days we are also in, in science and technology, uh, mm. going out of our way to ensure that women are there. Even in addition to that, we have to ensure that women have got role models. We must find and, 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 and promote science teachers so that when a girl child goes into a classroom, they can actually see someone who looks like them who is a scientist. Mm. So we have got to create yeah. a, an environment uh, within which uh, the empowerment of women and the people that the women can identify with uh, actually happens. Uh, Carlos, you said a little bit about it already, but as a CEO of a major company, what kind of policies do you think should be implemented to level that playing field? Well, uh, I, I can tell you, we have particularly uh, two things that we are doing. The first one is quota on hiring in all the categories. Engineers, you need 10 engineers. We, you know, we are obviously, the, our objective 50-50. Uh, we're not at 50-50 today, so every year we increase the quota of women when we go higher. You know, you need 100 engineers, fine. If the quota is 40%, you can hire 60 male and 40 female. That's the minimum. If, if, if you hire 60 males, you cannot, you cannot complete 100 without respecting this. That's number one. So the hiring with quota. The second one is um, the, the succession planning. This is very important. Mm. Succession planning is an important process in each large company where all the jobs in the company, once every year, you say, if something happens to you know, this person holding this job, who are the candidates who can take this job at all the level of the company, including executive committee? And here, uh, we have forced ranking. That means we're saying uh, you cannot complete your succession planning unless you have, depending on the position, 20% of uh, women ca female candidate, 30% of female candidate. At the beginning, uh, you can imagine that people say, yeah, we have nobody. Yeah, we have nobody, they're not prepared, they're not ready, etc." So it's fine. But su succession planning is not ready. You can't close your succession planning as long as. You don't have candidate this year, fine, it's open, okay? Mm -hmm. But next year, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to find a candidate. If we don't have them inside the company, you're gonna have to go and hire them from outside the company. So I, I think that managing through the hiring from one side, the succession planning from the other side, which means training, coaching, mm -hmm. uh, promoting, extremely important process. If you do these too well, you're going you're gonna to hit all your targets. I completely agree with Carlos, and I would add one measure. Measure. Mm -hmm. because, and, and measure very carefully and segment the workforce or segment the people you're talking about, because it's quite easy to reach 40% threshold in any organization. As long as you include everybody, fine. But actually, the higher you go in the hierarchy, the less women you have. So you have to measure by cohort or by you know, segment of, of your population, whether you talk company or whether you talk other organizations. Because once you measure it, then you can hold people accountable. But sort of broad measurements of those corporate leaders who say, 
45% women in my company. Uh -huh. <laughs> How about looking at the pyramid? Yeah. And then it doesn't look as good. Yeah. And disaggregates, disaggregate statistics, collect reliable data and disaggregate it. Whenever we're providing data that is just rounded yeah. and we don't say X amount of women have achieved it, X amount of men have it, you actually hide a lot. When you are a policymaker and you're responsible for the public resources, women are 51% of the population. You should be able to know that in the manner in which you spend those public resources, the, the other half, uh, which is the, no, for fact, <laughs> the 51% the, the <laughs> actually benefits adequately. The other challenge I think that we face now, we continuously talk about women having to be represented at a level of 30%. 51% of the population must be happy with 30%, please. You know, we're actually lowering the expectations as well. So there's, that trend also is, is actually a bit dangerous. So I'd like the 50-50 talk rather than the 30% talk. Sure. On corporate policies, uh, to add to what they said, and I, I agree with both, flexibility. So working hours are increasing. Technology, my industry is part of it. But working hours are dramatically increasing all over the world. And flexibility is a really big issue. Now, not every company can provide it in every case. But people can provide a lot more. I'll share one example. Mitsubishi Chemicals, Japanese company among the long hours anywhere in the world. Japan is the highest on the list. They made a rule that uh, meetings can only be one hour, and everyone had to go home at 7 PM. That's it. And performance did well. And everyone went home at 7 PM, and the meetings got shorter. I found in my own life, once I had children, I did more faster than I thought I could have done before, because I just had to. Otherwise, I never saw my son. Mm -hmm. And as I got more efficient, everyone else got more efficient, because everyone's tolerance for unnecessarily long meetings went mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to push ourselves in every organization uh, to be more flexible. I also want to say I so agree with this point. Mm. I've been thinking about it lately as the tyranny of low expectations. Mm. My great and dear friend, Senator Claire McCaskill, is here. And in the last US election, women run 20% of the votes in the Senate. And every headline in the US said, women take over the Senate. <laughs> 20% representation of 50% of the population is not a takeover. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. And I think it's great that we're here at Davos and women are on the agenda. Mm. But our goal is clear. We need to get off the agenda. Mm. Because women no longer need this special panel because mm. we are fully integrated into leadership, mm. into the economy, and to decision making all over the world. Uh, Cheryl, you've written about this before. So can I ask you, do women hold themselves back Society, I think, is so biased against women, and we grow up that way that everyone holds us back and we hold ourselves back. Here's what the data shows conclusively. When a man and a woman perform at the same level, the man and the woman, and everyone else remembers the man's performance slightly high and the woman slightly low. There are a lot of gender-blind studies of performance done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, orchestra, in orchestras behind a, behind a curtain tests and classes without names on. Every time you take gender out of the equation, what happens? Women do better than they do elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That shows you conclusively that we're gender biased, because when we don't know gender, women's performance increases. The other thing that happens is that men and everyone else ascribe male success to themselves. Why did I succeed? Because I'm good, because I'm smart. And that's good. But women and the rest of the world ascribe female success to being in the right time, the right place, lucky, working hard. Someone supporting you. You got help, you were mentored. Mm -hmm. And all of that's true for both men and women, but we ascribe success differently. That means that everyone is systematically underestimating women, and we are systematically underestimating ourselves. Everywhere I go, any meeting, I watch where men and women sit. At the same level of performance, more men sit in the center and at the table, and more women sit on the side. Mm -hmm. And so yes, women are holding themselves back, and yes, Men are holding us back. And yes, we are socialized mm -hmm. to hold ourselves back. And that's part of what I know Lean In is trying to change and what the great example of all three of my fellow panelists are trying to change. Yeah. <coughs> I just want to highlight also the issue of women in conflict <coughs> areas where there are peace processes. The inclusion of women as peacemakers, as critical participants to make the peace in those countries 
sustainable, ensures that even after the peace, women will have a chance to be represented in future government. We have found that in countries where women were involved in the peace talks, mm -hmm. there is a greater chance that they'll gain the confidence, they'll, be, uh, they'll avail themselves to run as, as, as candidate, and in many cases, they will also be mm -hmm. elected. So one of the important things that we also need to continue which is the involvement of women in all aspects mm -hmm. of life that affects them. And peacemaking, as we would see in Syria, as we'll see in Sudan, as we'll see in the Central African Republic, mm -hmm. in all of those areas, the involvement of women is fundamental for sustainable, su sustainable peace. Mm -hmm. I want to pose a slightly different question. Um, all of you here on the panel are extremely accomplished. You've achieved a lot and, and risen to a level that many women would say, you know, this is the kind of role model we're looking at. So I'm going to pose this question to Christine first. What's the worst case of discrimination that you've come across? I suppose you're asking me first because I'm the oldest in the group. <laughs> And that's okay. I, I'm happy with it. No. I want, I'll preface my response to you by one thing. I think I've succeeded and I'm here where I am. Because I was not aggressive, because I relied on teams, mm -hmm. and because I acknowledged the team and the support that they have been given me, and because we worked together. And I'm not ashamed of saying that. And I think that other types of management and leadership are fine. But if women can exercise leadership by being inclusive, by being team-minded, by paying back to the team, and you know what? If we can contaminate a few male leaders on that page, <laughs> and if we can contaminate a few of those males who don't succeed in reaching peace settlements, that's fine. And I'm prepared to fight for that. OK, now, worst discrimination I faced? My first interview with a big law firm in Paris, where I had qualified on all fronts. And uh, the managing partner said to me, we're giving you a job, but don't expect to make partnership. And I said, why is that? He looked at me with contempt. I said, because you're a woman. Oh. That was about 35 years ago. OK? Things have not changed enormously in many areas. Now, the law firm I lived my life with was not that law firm. <laughs> From Zealand. Well, mine is a bit dramatic because I grew under apartheid, where mm. there was both race and gender. In South Africa, there were laws under apartheid that decided, for instance, that women could not a contract on their own without the help of a male adult or, for that matter, son. Mm. So, I mean, how worse can it get? I didn't have a son at that point, and I can just imagine if mm. I, uh, you know, that had to happen. But that was the way the law was. Cheryl. Mm. Well, certainly growing up in mm. apartheid in South Africa is an experience that I, I, haven't, I haven't faced. And I think I've actually been pretty lucky. I've faced a lot of the smaller stuff. I've been at dinners recently where men speak and it's fine and men literally put their hands here like, stop speaking now to me and the other. <gasps> there was a dinner, there were two women. <gasps> Everyone kind of was talking except when I spoke or the other woman spoke, we were told not to like this, hands to our faces. No. Nothing like South African apartheid, but mm. shocking in today's day and age. But I have <sighs> friends who have been fired when they got pregnant in the last few years in big cities in the United States. Um, I have had friends uh, unfairly and ridiculously sexually propositioned in offices. I think Christine's point that, yes, things have changed, mm. but they have not changed enough. Mm. And a lot of the things that we would think just don't happen anymore, particularly in the developed world, are still happening. Mm. Uh, Carlos. <laughs> You're going to ask me the same question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Yes, <laughs> if you like. No, 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 no. no. Let, let, let's, let's answer this because this is about diversity. It is. I mean, Absolutely. we're talking about women here, but there is a lot of segregation yes. when a person is different. Yes. It yes. can be a foreigner. Yes. It can be a young person in a society which is most value 
seniority. Mm. It can be a senior person in a society which is much more good. I mean, what we're talking about here is discrimination yes. for reasons which are nothing to do with yeah. talent, yeah. nothing to do with contribution. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that here in the room, many people can relate to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But we're focusing on you know, gender mm. uh, uh, discrimination. But there are so many other discrimination mm. we ought to fight against yeah. Yeah. because it's, an, it's, a, it's a huge potential, mm. particularly for companies or even for yeah. countries yeah. that we need to unlock. Yeah. Mm. Prejudice against their home debts is a problem for women yeah. as well. So it's, it's a prejudice we have to fight mm. against. Before I open this up to the audience, I'm going to do a really quick fire. The best advice you've ever been given for getting ahead. Cheryl. Believe in yourself and believe you can change things. Okay. Whenever you fall, fall forwards and rise. <laughs> Greet your teeth and smile. <laughs> Try. <laughs> Carlos. There's no problem without solution. Yeah. Great. The, uh, the floor is now open. Um, uh, so please uh, raise your hand. A microphone will come around to you. Please say who you are and who you would like to answer your question, or if you'd like the whole panel to answer your question. And as a reminder, first two rows stay seated. The rest of you, please stand. Uh, right here, um, in front. OK. And then we'll come to, and then we'll come here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. My name is yes. Dina Wuchbinder. Okay. Uh, I am a global shaper from the Mexico City Hub. And I am most passionate about this this issue related to education. I am wondering if we could go back to fundamentals. Where does this all come from? Do you think, when, when you speak about girls' education, do you think, uh, where, where is the place of girls' and boys' education for them to understand the same as, as in access to opportunities that will be the same for both, as normal, not as something that that's unusual. Would you like to take that? Well, I think teacher training actually is, is the place to begin. Because teachers uh, influence children a lot. I think those of us who are parents, you know that when your children are young, when you try to say something and say, no, my teacher didn't say so, because they look up to them. If uh, our education systems, our curriculum are properly engendered, and if we had teachers who are able to impart knowledge in a manner that infuses these uh, values mm -hmm. of respecting both men and women, encouraging both girls and boys to see themselves as equal, education would do society a great service. But many of our teachers come out of teacher training school without that mm -hmm. uh, uh, background. And I think it's part of what now we have to do because we're trying to correct. But of course, going to the children directly, as parents, as society, is also important. But I would say that teacher training is actually an important area where we need to intervene. A question here in front. Let's bring the mic over. We'll try to get through as many of these as, as we can. <laughs> yes, please. My name is uh, Deepak Jain. I was, until recently, the dean of INSEAD, and before then, the dean of Kellogg School of Management. And if Ms. Christian Lagarde would allow me, I had the pleasure of having her in my class. <laughs> Am I correct? That was a good teacher. Yes, I know. My point is to Carlos and Christine. I believe that for us to close the gender gap, first we also need to focus on giving them an opportunity. Mm. And my passion has been to focus on countries where women don't get that chance. So we have set up a university in Bangladesh called Asian University for Women, where we are targeting countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, where it is not common for women to go for higher education. Mm -hmm. And my question would be in a minute, first year when I went there, and I'm going there next week again, a girl from Afghanistan came to me and said, Dean Jen, I never had the opportunity to, to see the sun. Because, you know, they are all glad. Mm. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. She did so well. We sent her to Stanford University, and she graduated with two degrees. Great. So is my question is, how can we get resource? Because here, these women cannot pay. So are there ways for us to promote <coughs> these type of education, not only in Bangladesh, mm. countries in Africa and others? And would you help me 
in terms of finding sources and not only the monetary, but I also need some human help to come and teach, not for pay, thank but you. for other reasons. Great, thank you. Yeah. Well, Deepak, I'd like to pay tribute to you because you have indeed focused on education your entire life, mm -hmm. and you are now focusing on the education of girls in countries like Bangladesh and other places. So I'm so pleased that you're here and that you can uh, attest to that. You know, it, we haven't talked much about money, but at the end of the day, it's a question of what budget is available to help, whether it's the budget for the care, daycare centers in Japan or whether it's the budget to help with the education of young uh, Bangladesh girls, Afghanistan girls, Pakistani girls, and many African countries, children, not just mm -hmm. girls. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, it has to be part of the uh, development goals, not in terms of uh, quantity, but in terms of quality. It has to be targeted, mm -hmm. it has to be better measured. And I think that the private sector has to be embarked on that initiative. I mean, there are very, very wealthy universities around the world. You know quite a few, and you've taught in some of them. They have to partner. They have to spend a bit of money outside of home. And they have to be proud of it. And, you know, make their students proud of being associated, twinned, or however they want to call it, but putting some money aside for other projects that are not necessarily on the curriculum of those big universities would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think there are two kinds of uh, financing or financial support. The first one, which the company does for itself. For example, we have a huge technical center in Japan, in Atsugi. We have about 15,000 engineers. Uh, you know, when we started, we had 99% males. We gave ourselves an objective to have, as a first step, 10%. Well, we put the goal. We start to hire, but women left until we created uh, child care centers inside the technical center and things changed. So this is the kind of investment companies have to do to be consequent with themselves. This is one thing, this is easy. But then the other things that you're mentioning is uh, Nissan helping women in Afghanistan being educated even though you don't have any plant or any facility. But this is through corporate social responsibility programs. And every company has some kind of guidance. In our case, we have two objectives where we practically put all the money behind uh, the programs. One is environment, which is obvious, and the second one is diversity. And when we talk about diversity, we're coming. So I think in order to promote that, we need to push companies to put diversity in their corporate social responsibility programs. Because I, I don't think you're going to get too much in countries like France or Europe, but you're going to get a lot when it comes to a lot of the emerging markets. Great. <laughs> yeah, okay. Question there. If you can have the uh, microphone, please. As a man, I feel very accused today. And I uh, think that I have a good advice to the women's society uh, to stay all for a mirror, not the three of you, because you have done already, and look what you can do yourself. Uh, because the men are not stupid. When they can get a good woman as a general manager, he will take it. And with the knowledge of 85% choosing automobiles, I really don't understand. But the women themselves, you can't force it by quota. Forget it. We have milk quota in Holland. It didn't work. And quota is forced. The women should do it themselves organize themselves and should show the, 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 the other part, with the other uh, the, the man, that they are better or they can do it also. But okay. don't do it forced, do it <laughs> yourself. Thank you. I, of course. Okay. Yep. I accept <laughs> yep. that. I just, Sorry, Christine I just, first. I just mm. want to set the record straight yeah. for your country, the Netherlands. Because there are things that your country has done that has actually promoted women in a big, big way. Yes. And that is allowing for... But it's not because the women went out to show that they were strong and good, and which they are. It's because the policymakers understood that and therefore implemented flexible time situations, good policy regulations applicable to the labor market so that women could be welcome to the labor market. So it takes, it takes two to tango. Right? <laughs> Fonzila, you wanted to yeah, come in. No, but also, I think there's an assumption there that men are where they are because there's something good that they did. You know, they didn't have to prove anything. I think there's also an assumption that uh, men represent the best of humanity. Please. 
<laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm going to pick um, the hand right there, sort of right there, because I think this might be on a similar point. Um, pass the mic, please, to the woman in red. And, and then I'll come here. Okay. Thank you. My name is Akudo Anyao Ikemba, and I'm a WEF YGL. I'm very proud of the ladies on the stage. Um, my question is for um, UN Women. Um, I'm very proud of the work that you're doing. Um, but I have a question about the lives that African women are living in Africa. Um, there's a lot that we don't bring to the forefront and a lot that we don't talk about. And I'm very interested in um, your experience, madam, in engaging government on some of the crimes that are being committed against women in Africa, mm. those crimes that are being veiled with culture mm. and honor, um, all the widowhood practices that go on, all the issues that affect, affect the girl child. In, in all our countries, we call it different things. In Malawi, it's called removing the dust. In, um, in Nigeria, where I come from, um, there are lots of widowhood practices where women have to you know, get maltreated once their husbands die. These are all sort of all hidden under culture, and no one is talking about it enough. And I would love to see a situation where these things are really brought to the forefront at the WEF summits and a lot of other sort of global level summits so that we can start to tease out what really is culture and what's crime. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Well, yeah. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the United Nations. These things are not actually hidden under the table. I think uh, one of the issues that uh, has been uh, spoken about a lot in relation to violence against women has been uh, the mutilation of, um, of women and, and girls. And uh, in many countries, governments have been forced to move to adopt legislation that addresses that. However, that has not been enough because of what uh, the speaker points out, cultural practices. It is where we actually work with civil society because civil society is able to shame and name, but also to take an active role in trying to bring about correctional, uh, uh, to, to take correctional actions. We are not there yet. Uh, we have many African countries with constitutions that promote equality, and they also have legislation that promotes equality, but implementation is actually quite poor. That makes the importance of women's uh, movement to be uh, very relevant and very strong. But however, this is not the responsibility of women alone, even in rural areas, even in, 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 in all parts of countries where these practices are. It is the, the responsibility of, bet, of both good men and good women. Thank you. Well, I'm going to squeeze in one last question here. And apologies to, to all of you. I know we could go on, but. Ex excellent panel and such an honor to be here. My name is Desiree McGraw and I'm from Quebec. We have some very progressive policies, $7 a day childcare, extended maternity, parental and, and paternity leave. It's made a huge difference. 50% of our cabinet ministers are women. Um, this is part of our culture. So my question to the panel is about politics. I think we can do a lot on the micro scale uh, mm. in business and social enterprise, but at the end of the day, it's about public policy. Mm. And these policies are in place in Quebec largely because women were in, were in mm. cabinet. Mm. So I don't think there are any politicians, <laughs> uh, elected politicians on the panel, but if you could speak to that, because it seems to me that is such a key issue and politics being even more aggressive than business, uh, where women really are often not well liked for, for standing up and, and being good. Uh, yeah. politics so if someone could speak to that uh, I might have to uh, well I was going to go to Christine first yeah. former French finance minister but <laughs> you, you 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 are dead right uh, there are not enough women in politics and when women are in politics they make a huge difference Absolutely. we were talking about the US senator mm. earlier on mm. well who actually managed to to break this this gridlock that prevented uh, the US federal operations to actually operate predominantly women. Then, then the process went on. But those who actually made the decision to get on with this, this stupid opposition, sterile, for all purposes, were women. So yeah, there has to be women in politics, and they have to just take the, the future of humanity in their own hand, even if they are still way too much of a minority. And it's important for women to elect women. Because the fact that women yeah. are in a, a majority, mm. and yet, uh, in many cases, uh, we elect men, is a problem 
because uh, if women were able to prioritize women, good women, because also it's not good enough just to elect a woman because she's a woman. You have also to ensure that they will do the right thing once they, they are on the job and supports them to be the best uh, uh, they can be. But I couldn't agree with, with you more. In my own country, in South Africa, a lot of the good policies have been pushed uh, by women, and women have played a very active role in, in, in politics and in parliaments. Cheryl, could we see you in politics? <laughs> Not for me, but a wholesale agreement, just wholesale agreement that uh, we need more women in politics, and the recent, the recent stuff in the US Senate proves it. Mm. Um, we are afraid out of time, but um, I want to give a final comment to each of my panelists. Um, you all know this issue inside and out. Was there something surprising from today's discussion that you've noticed and, and would take away? Cheryl. I don't think it's surprising. I think it's important we keep having the discussion. Um, but what I really liked about today's discussion is the sense of impatience, because we've been having this discussion for a long time. And to your point, we can't stop short of 50%. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, maybe not so much surprising, but I'm, I'm actually um, encouraged uh, that uh, we have as many men and women in the audience. Because there's also been a tendency that when we spoke about women, is women speaking to women. I think what we see in this audience is actually progress. Mm. Great. Christine. No, I'm just very grateful to you for having organized this debate and grateful to the audience for their participation. I, I fear that we will have to do it yet again a few more times before we get to Cheryl's objective, which is to have it off the agenda, because we will have reached the goal. Thank you. Carlos. Well, actually, uh, if there is one thing which surprises me today, not so much about the debate, because as you said, we have been saying this, it's when I look at the public, usually when we talk about women, we have a majority of women today, it's balanced. Yeah. You know, that which means that yeah. it's not anymore, uh, it's not anymore an issue of the past. It's something that everybody going through today. Mm. We're moving in the right direction. Mm. Obviously, hopefully, the speed is going to get just higher. Yeah, oh, terrific. Well, there's a, there's a BBC program on Radio 4 called Women's Hour, mm. and um, over 40% of the audience is men. Mm. Um, so now there's a slight concern if that audience goes any higher. Mm. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, this was a, a terrific panel. Um, and that is all we have time for. It's been a huge topic as to why gender gap persists. We've discussed the evidence that it's harmful to businesses and to economies. We've looked at policy alternatives. Perhaps gender-driven growth policies are just what a sluggish global recovery needs. Please join me in thanking my stellar panel, Carlos Ghosn, Christine Lagarde, Pumzile, Malambo, Naguka, and Cheryl Sandberg. And thanks to all of you, the audience, for your participation. And a huge thanks to the World Economic Forum for get, uh, partnering with the BBC on this panel and special broadcast of Talking Business with me, Linda Yu. Thanks, everybody. Really?